Hello, and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. I'm going to continue today teaching you rhythms and teaching you how to play music and going over some of the signs that, to make you more familiar with them. And so, I, but first I want to just review a few of the things that I've taught you already. So if we can look at this chart here, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just the ones we'll be using. You're pretty familiar with them by now. And what I'm particularly paying attention to is is this DC da capo. When you have a DC, it means go back to the beginning of the music. Now, there won't be any sign at the beginning of the music, but this tells you that's where you're supposed to go. So there doesn't have to be any sign there. But what you may find is you may find a little word called refrain. And that's the beginning of the music that you're going to be playing again. And what that refrain means in the musical terms is the fact that you're playing the melody again. You've started playing it again. So it's like a refrain. Now, that's not the way that we use the word in the English language for the most part. Refrain means stopping something, not doing something. But at the same time, the language that is in the music is sometimes very similar to the language that we use in every everyday life, but the meanings may be different. So at any rate, as long as you're aware of that. So that would be de capo from the beginning is what it actually means, de capo from the beginning. Now, ds del segmo, that ds as, uh, means go back to the sign. And this is the sign where I have it pointed here. It looks like an odd little S with a slash across it and four little dots, one in each of the segments, uh, if you wanted to consider the subdivided. And that means go back to the sign. And the sign can be anywhere in the music that you want to put it, as long as you put it in a place where eventually you reach fine. Alfine, which means the end. So that DS Alfino me means go back to the sign and play to the end of the song. You know that you are in the end of the song when it says fine, F I N E. It's pronounced fine, it's spelled fine. And so you have to put the sign so that at some point you run into that fine. Otherwise, you'd be playing the whole song again, and that's not what the purpose is. But that's the only restriction. And, and of course, you understand the repeat signs. You go to wherever you're going to repeat. You, say, you see these two lines or the two dots. You go back to the place that has the two lines, but the two dots are in front, but in another direction. That's where the repeat is, and then you play it all again. And you're aware of the metronome marking, a uh, quarter note equals, and then how many beats a minute? 60 beats a minute, 50, 40, 80, whatever it happens to be. And that's called the metronome marking. And if you have a metronome, which I don't, then you could set it and you would see it would go tick tock, tick tock, wherever, whatever the timing would be. So you would know that a 4-4 four, four, uh, measure would be tick tock, tick tock, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so forth. So I just want to go over that with you. And then here again, the repeat signs, you get to this and you play this, when you first play it, you get here, and there's your repeat mark, and you go back, and when you play it again, you skip this because you played it the first time, and you play this, and that's called the second ending. Or with repeat signs, you get here, you get the repeat, and you just play the whole thing again. There's no first or second ending. There doesn't have to be, but there is in a lot of music. So, fine means end. Alfino, alfine means go to the end or go to the finish. DC alfine, go back to the beginning and play to the end, which would be alfine. DS alfine would be go back to the sign, wherever it is, and then finish the song. And here again is the sign. I, when I tend to write music, I tend to do it simpler. I just write a little S and put a couple of dots in. That's what I mean. I'm reminding myself that's where it is, but that's what the sign actually looks like. And then the only other thing I want to review with you would be the notes. 
It, and we're talking about four, four time, but it's the same in three, four time, basically. You have a whole note, you split it in half, it gives you two halves. Two halves equal a whole. You split the half and you get a, a two quarters, actually. And uh, two quarters will equal a half. Two halves equal a whole. If you take and split the quarter, you get two eighths. If you take an eighth and split it, you get two sixteenths, and that would be the double flag where the eighth note has just the one flag. If you were to split the sixteenth, you would get 32nd notes with three flags, but we're not dealing with that, but I want to show you what it is. And if you took the 16th notes, uh, or the 32nd notes, and you split it, you would get the 64th notes, which would be four flags. So it's a case of subdivision, subdivision, and subdivision. So that's just kind of a quick review. Remember that you count rest exactly like you count regular beats. Here's a four beat rest. In other words, you're not playing. When, it's, when you're resting, when you have a rest, you do not play. This is a, a four beat rest and it hangs down from the fourth line. The half rest pops up from the third line. It's just two beats. This would be like the quarter rest. This would be like an eighth rest, and you notice a one flag to it, just like there is on an eighth note. And then on the sixteenth note, there's different ways of writing it. You can use two flags, and sometimes you use the two dots behind it. And that's the sixteenth beat, equivalent to a sixteenth beat, which is the sixteenth rest. So there are different ways of doing it. And, uh, but basically, you can't go wrong. Now, um, let's see if I have that with me. Well, here's, I'm just going to show this to you. Here's, I'm not going to play it because I didn't bring my own copy, but here's three-fourths time. So you have your, your key signature, which is F sharp, and that F sharp puts it in the key of G, and I will explain sometime how that works, but I'm not going to do it right now. Three-fourths beat, here is a three, since this is a whole rest, it will have three beats because anything that's whole, the whole note or the whole rest, will have the same number of beats as the measure says it has. So if this was four, four time, that would be worth four beats. Here it is only worth three beats because you only have three beats to the measure. Now this is your half rest, one, two, three. This is two beat rest and one beat right here for the quarter note. Then if you were to count it, one and two, three. Remember one and two and three and four and is how you actually count the eighth notes. One and two, three, one, two, three, one and two, three, one, two, three, one and two, three, one, two, three. And then you have one and two, three, one, two, three. It's the same basic pattern all the way through the song. And it's not a hard song to play. It is a waltz. And I'll try to find my copy and bring that in. So right now, I'm interested in playing this particular piece here, and it's a dance which I wrote, and you'll notice the time signature four beats to a measure, four, four time, the quarter note gets one beat, so this would be four. I also have a little fermata, that little kind of an arch thing with a dot underneath it, that's a fermata, also called a hold, and you can hold that. So when I start playing it, and it also acts as an introduction, I play that once, and I hold it, and then I go and I play it all the way through what the tempo is. Now, the word fine is right here, but I'm not going to do anything with it because I'm going right up to here and playing all the way down here, all the way down here. And then here I have another fermata, which is a hold. I'm going to hold that beat, even though it's an eighth note. I'll hold it as long as I want, but in a song like this it won't be very long. And then two little tiny slash marks, which means I'm taking just a fraction of a second break. So I'll take that little tiny break and that this DC means go back to the beginning. So this is the beginning and uh, it says refrain. 
It, it, that's the, the thing as I'm playing the melody again. That's what that refrain means. And it says, ah, tempo. So I play it at the original tempo. I've slowed this, I've slowed this down because this is a retard. I get here and I slow it down even more because this is a hold. And then when I get here, if I start on this note, I'm going to hold that again. And then when I start playing this, I'm playing it at the full speed that I was playing before. I bring it up to what the speed is. It's not slow. It goes back to the original speed. I play this and I play this. This is the fine. This is the end of the song. Now, one thing that I want to show you is the fact that on the slur, this is a slur. This is a slur. Uh, it's kind of uh, sometimes called a tie, but it's really a slur because I'm using different notes. And you tongue the first one and you don't tongue the second one. Now, that gives a little bit of a difference in the way that the music sounds. So just to show you, I, I do the e, I uh, tongue the, the E, I do not tongue the D because it's slurred. I go into it without tonguing it. If I were to tongue it, it would sound like this. Instead, it gives it a little different quality because it's not being tongued. And I'm playing it fairly fast, too. So let me play it. And I think I'm going to slow it down. I want you to pay attention to the music. See if you can follow me. Because if you can follow me, then you're well on your way to being able to read the music. This is a D, and it goes up to a high D. And so, therefore, on the uh, recorder, you play the low D with all other fingers except the little finger covering the holes. And then to uh, play the high D, you lift all of your fingers and just use the one finger in the left hand. Or in my case, I may use the flute fingering, which is a lot similar. Well, let me play this, and then you can just kind of follow it and follow me as a, a, see if you can follow the music. Now that's the whole song using the signs which I have put on. I haven't put on a lot of signs. Uh, I have put on the retard sign down here. I have the holes. I have the DC. So you go back to the beginning where it says refrain. Now, not all music may have that word refrain on there, but with the DC, it's likely that it does because it happens a lot of times. And I have the out tempo telling me to go as fast as I did in the beginning. So there's not too much in terms of fingering that you can have a problem with. Um, Let's see. What you might have a problem with is this is an F sharp because it's an F sharp in the key signature. Here is the G, which is right above it. Here is the G sharp. It's the same as the G, but you've raised it a half a step because that is sharp. And then the A follows that. That's like a that's like a, uh, a type of scale, a chromatic scale. A scale is just notes that go up and down. And they come in different keys and you, in different octaves and so forth. But when you have a chromatic scale, you raise it a half a pitch or you lower it a half a pitch. If I'm going to sharp it, if I'm going up, I'm going to sharp it by a half a pitch. So on this note, that G and that G sharp, the G is three fingers down. And then I can get that G sharp in two ways. I can either half hole it, which moves this third finger out. But the best way to do it is to lift that G and put these first two fingers down.
you can see it's the same note. So the traditional way would be not to have whole, but to use these two fingers. Now, whether I do it or not, whether I, whichever fingering I decide to use, partly depends upon how fast I'm trying to play it. If I'm playing a song that's real fast, it may be easier for me to half hold than to switch fingers around. Because it does take some energy and you've got to be accurate in how you do it. So in a chromatic scale, when you're going up, you're going up by half a step. When you're going up, it's sharp. When you're going down, it's, it's flatted. It's still a half a step, but it's flatted. So to go sharp, your notes will go up. And then if I want to go down, I'm going to flat it. Sharp. That was flattered. So when you get here, you are actually playing a part of a chromatic, uh, a, a chromatic scale from that F sharp, G, G sharp, A. Now it's a small part of a chromatic scale, but that's what it is. Now uh, there's lots of scale work in music. Here we have that uh, D, uh, E, D, and then you skip one, B, A, G. That's really all part of scale work. And then uh, a lot of times you have to realize there are intervals between the notes, so the notes don't come just one right after the other. And I'm going to get into the intervals of music a little later on. It's not hard, but if you stop to think, what's a third, what's a fourth, what's a fifth? And it's important that you kind of know it, so I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to show you. If you want to play a third, that's a third, there are three notes involved, but you're going from the lowest to the top note of that series of three. If you want a fourth, That's the fifth. Six. The last is an octave. I was using the same lowest note. I'm using the D, and I'm going up. So the third, first one is a third, and then the fourth. And then a fifth, six, seven, usually does not sound too good if played together. And that's the octave, which is an eighth. Now, why should you know what the intervals are? Because when you're playing music, you see it. Like this is an eighth. This is an octave right here. And uh, from here, the D to an E is just one step. And when you get the different notes, like for example, if I were to go from this B to a G, that would be a third. It's important, especially for singers, to know this because singers don't have an instrument that they're playing a lot of times. They're looking at the music and they have kind of have got to know what the intervals are so they can sing the right note. It's not so difficult for instrumentalists because the note is there and you're playing it. And as long as you have your fingers in the right place and your fingerings are correct, you're going to get the right note. So that's not a problem. But a singer doesn't have the instrument to rely on. It's just their voice. So whatever they come out with singing, it needs to be correct in terms of the intervals because if they're singing something without some kind of a, an orchestral background and they don't know the music, how do they know that they're playing the right note? Well, this note is a fourth above the other one, or this note is a sixth above the other one, or a third below the other one, and they can kind of feel their way along. And for them, it's natural. They know how to do that. Instrumentalists don't rely upon that so much, but it's handy if you're composing, because if I'm composing something, and I'm, I'm totally making this up in my head, I 
just made this whole thing up. And it's a song. And uh, if I think of it, when I get home, I'll script it. But what, uh, how did I know? I decided I was going to make a song out of a fourth. This is a... This is a fourth. And then when I go... That's a third. That's a fourth. And that helps me to get started. Now, I may not be doing that with every single note. I'm just playing what's coming into my head. But at any rate, if you can start off with, a, with a, um, an interval, like you know, the six usually sounds pretty good. I just wrote another song. That's just, just completely out of my head. But if you know the intervals, it gives you a chance to get started. You want a fifth, you want a sixth, you want a fourth, whatever you think. Now, some people, they just, they just, the music just comes to them. And usually it does me if I want to write a song. Okay, it's time for me to write a song. I need a song with, with this or that that I want to show, something that I want to teach you. And all of a sudden, it's right there. I don't even have to fight for it. You know, some people have to struggle and struggle. Well, let's try this chord and let's try that chord. And does this sound right? And should I follow this note with that? It just comes to me. And so I just play it, you know, and there it is. I've got it. So you can create music. And I think it's a help to get started by knowing what the intervals are so that you can say, well, let's do something on a third. Another song. So at any rate, that's that's the way that it is. Now let me play this once again and follow along. This is one beat. The the eighth note and the sixteenth uh, notes are one beat because the eighth note is half of a quarter, and the sixteenths, if you put them together, are another eighth note, which is another half to the quarter. So this added up is one beat. One two and three and four and one and two and three, four. So let me play it again because we're kind of running out of time here. the whole song. And it's not that hard. Once you know the fingerings and once you know the timing, then you can just play it. But don't start off going fast. Start off going slow and then just gradually working up on the speed and you'll be able to play that. And remember, this tells you, these signs tell you where to go. This one, you go all right up here, and then you end here. But there's a lot more going on in the music. You've got to be able to tongue the notes. You've got to be able to finger the notes correctly. And so we'll close it here. Uh, please join me next time when we'll be doing something else. <laughs>